And welcome to the MedTech Wealth Advisor podcast with your host, Matthew Nelson. Matthew, good to be with you again. You know, the last episode, you talked about why you choose to work and focus on the MedTech industry. What do you got in store for us this week? Yeah, I, I think it's going to be I think it's gonna be interesting. Um, there's there's some different different aspects of this industry that we have to keep in mind. Um you know what I think I might do just for just for a minute, if you don't mind, Bill, is is just kind of refresh something we might have touched on in one of the first uh, first three episodes. Okay. But I want to emphasize a little bit about why it's kind of different to be focusing on an industry at all. So, um, you know, I'm sure you have a you have a family doctor, and you yeah. understand how that goes, and. You know, I'm pretty sure you don't go to your family doctor and ask for him to look at your heart and give you a heart transplant. It's no, no. great guy. I love great him. Guy. No. Right. <laughs> yes. Yes. And, and, you know, it's, I mean, it sounds just ridiculous to say out loud. It, it's, it's kind of a funny thing in the, uh, in our industry, for whatever reason, financial services has kept sort of a generalist type of approach to things. It's super common in the medical industry, yeah. architecture, you know, you name it, the other professions. It'd be weird if you didn't have um, some sort of specialty or niche. And so I just want to emphasize that, that this, this is not common in the industry. It should be more common. Um, but we found as we um, have honed in on just one industry, we, we end up offering better advice. We are better at our job. We give a uh -huh. better client experience, and um, and it just makes it more fun. Well, it, it it's interesting. I mean, intuitively, I think I understand it, but but explain to me what's so different, if you will, about the med tech industry itself. Yes, um, you know, it's. I think it comes down to. Um, I mean, there's, there's a number of things, but things that we're going to talk about today anyways, it is having to do with the, it, how the industry is different with people's mindset, um, what they're dealing with in the industry, how they think. Uh, there's some common employee benefits we find in this industry that aren't in all industries, um, wouldn't be the same in airline industries, for instance, or retail, mm -hmm. uh, maybe construction. Um, there could be some parallels in big tech, for instance. And so some of these aren't so unique that they never happen, but they're, they're far more common. At least we see in the way that they're set up here. And that, uh, that creates some different planning opportunities and, um, just some challenges from our end is we're, we're putting together cash flow plans and investment plans and so forth. So huh. that's, that's, I think what we'll cover. Well, what, what, what is it? I, I'm not being in the med, med tech industry myself, I, yeah. Tell me what it is. I'm sure that you know your listeners are, are well acquainted with it. But for someone like me who might be listening, why don't we talk about what it is that does make it different and does affect the advice, the kind of advice that you inform your clients with? Okay. You know, what we see is that um, we find the med tech industry, is, it's generally full of mission-driven professionals. Mm-hmm. That are they're just really focused on the in, the the impact their career is going to make, and um, that that creates a certain mindset and how focused they are in their career, how much time they devote to it, how much time they kind of uh, don't have for other things, um, and so you know these are these are people who are highly educated. They could easily handle this stuff on their own if they had the time, but I think they're they're just they don't have the time. Their career doesn't offer it, and um, you know whether you're, um, whether you're in med device sales, you're in the management side, um, or you know you're doing a startup in the industry. There's there's just a number of either kind of multipliers or disastrous landmines that that could really have an effect <laughs> on the personal finance. Oh, that's interesting. So the first thing when when we jump into the to the industry, I mentioned this mission driven, and and I I want to give a, a shout out to um, Michael Moore. So I've heard his. His podcast is an executive recruiter in, in the space. And I heard this phrase on his podcast. He said that the people that are, are usually most successful in this industry, they're mission-driven, patient-centric, and they're force multipliers. And so 
I, I just, I really, I thought that was a great way to sort of capture how people's mentality is. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's really that they want to be able to improve healthcare at scale. And so that's the mission. How do you, how do you make sure that the next device you're building is um, going to save your child or maybe a thousand other children? And that's a different kind of feeling when you get up at uh, for work in the morning than, you know, other industries. I don't want to yeah. pick on other industries in general. No, no, but it is a different mindset without picking on any, anybody. I mean, just, just straight up recognition. It is a different kind of mindset. Yes. Yep. And so with that, and we talked about sort of a demanding career with, with basically little time, it's also really difficult to break into. I mean, you've, you've got fairly high education levels, um, technical skills that take a long time to develop. And, and then the complexity of the market is, I mean, from, from my view being not in the industry, but just serving the industry, it, the complexity is off the charts between the science and engineering and the regulation bureaucracy and just the way the product distribution is. And so what we see is again, people are just so focused on a whole different set of set of balls they're juggling that they really just need to hire, um, or, or work with somebody knowledgeable to help them coordinate some things. Um, the, the opportunities we see, so you've got their mindset, the challenges, and then the opportunities, um, because of, because of those things, uh, this is a fairly high compensation level in the industry, mm -hmm. maybe not as high as, as some of the big tech industry. Um, but that's, it's also kind of interesting. I think they're, they could make more probably at a, you know, typical Google or an Apple type of yeah. type of space. Um, but their mission driven nature, wanting to be in it for something else keeps them here. And, um, the complexity allows for a fairly high risk, high reward relationship when you're doing startup companies. Mm. Um, and so let me, let me back up and phrase it this way. Um, if you wanted to, to be in the space and, and start up a company, new med device okay. um, company, you know, this, this isn't being done by sort of your, your classic hoodie wearing, you know, young kid learned a little bit of coding in high school, went to college, <laughs> dropped out two years later, yeah. starts the next unicorn in their mom's basement. Like that just doesn't happen really in the space. Not in the space. No. I mean, you're, it's more like, you know, aerospace engineer joins the industry and figures out how to use whatever, you know, fiber optics in some yeah. weird way. It's just way beyond my pay grade, but um, it, it's usually people starting these companies are advanced in their careers, which is good on one hand, that they, they may have the capital and the ability to handle that. They also don't have a lot of time left if it doesn't work out. So there's, mm. there's even more risk reward in that sort of, that sort of idea. And so, so I think the industry just thinks different. And I think the, the opportunity set is very different. Um, and what it really means is we have to do the right planning ahead of time so people can be prepared for that. So yeah. it's, it, it's a bit of a, you know, you should well, put the, go ahead. No, no, no. I was going to say, what, explain to me about the, what is it about the industry? You, you've kind of alluded to it a couple of times. Mm -hmm. It necessitates good planning. Are there things that are different either in the way of compensation or, you know, is there something different? Because everybody, we would generally agree, needs to have good planning or should have mm -hmm. good planning. Mm -hmm. It's helpful. It's good, right? So what is it that's that's different? What circumstances are different for, for workers in the med tech industry that they that you can help them with? Yes. Yeah. So we're so the the part that I think I'm driving at here is that be, because it's a, a bit of a helper first mentality in some ways. Yeah. Um, and, you know, they need to put their oxygen mask on first, so to speak. And if they haven't prepared well enough before these opportunities arise, whether it's to join a startup company, mm -hmm. if they have a strong uh, tie to the mission or start up their own company, they could put themselves in it really much 
more risky position than they might realize they've done with with their household. How so? It's, it, well, because uh, the the drive to kind of make a difference may drive them to take more risk than they really should. You mean financial risk? Financial risk, exactly. Okay. So it's 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 all good that that they're in a, a career that they love, they're making a difference, but just be aware that that drive to make a difference could drive you to take more risks than you should. Interesting. What what are are the benefits something that are the, different in the med tech industry? Yeah, so, you know, that's when we look at where people are working, um the the majority of the industry is is in kind of the large companies, sort of the the majors, if you will. So we're talking yeah. about the the big publicly traded companies like a Medtronic or a Boston Sci or you know Abbott, and and that's I, I did a study recently where I looked at the where all the employees were, and you know I'm, I'm rounding here, but it turned out to be um, the top ten percent of employers in the industry mm -hmm. employ. 90% of the employees. And so you just wrap your head around that for a second. Wow. So the <laughs> bottom, the bottom 90% in com number of companies yeah. only employs about 10% of the industry. So, you know, you, you, the bulk of people are working for these majors. Um, and then often, like I was just talking about launching, going off to launch their own, their own company. So that's where we're going to focus is because in these, in these big publicly traded companies, they have some specific benefits that, that aren't always there for other companies. Um, one of them's equity compensation. Okay. Um, and I'll preface this too, by saying, and I should have said at the top of the show that, you know, there's so much to unpack in, in each of these topics. We're just going to hit the highlights because several of these are really going to need their whole they're an entire episode really to, to yeah, remember. and we can absolutely, you know, for those who are listening, pay attention and subscribe because I'm, I'm sure you're going to delve into them in future episodes. Yes. Yes. So the, 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 uh, common benefits we see in some of these, some of these companies that, that don't apply to all companies, um, you've got equity compensation, which we'll talk mm -hmm. about in a second, something called net unrealized appreciation and, an interesting benefit, um, kind of a fun name. It's called a mega backdoor Roth IRA, a mega backdoor Roth. Um, there's some others, but we're going to hit those, those three. Okay. So equity compensation, you have any idea what that is, Bill? Have you, have you well, had to deal I mean, with that before? That is my paycheck. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Generally speaking, it's my paycheck. I mean, so, I'm sure that they're also, you know, I, I, Especially in the medtech startups, there's prob probably part of that equity compensation has to do with stock options and some other things. I would imagine. Absolutely, yeah. It it's equity compensation comes in in a number of forms, but the the most common, especially in the public space, you've got you have RSUs, so restricted stock units, okay, uh, stock options, and then a lot of companies will offer an ESPP, which stands for Employee Stock Purchase Plan. Um. Meaning purchase in the company they work for. That's right. Okay. Yes, that's right. The the RSUs, again, one of the most uh, common really, it's it's basically like getting um, stock added to your paycheck. I mean, there's obviously much more to that, but it's 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 basically like getting paid in stock. Okay. Um, and you're taxed on it like like pay. Um, these are these are often used as maybe um, a way to bonus people. Um, it's part of your your job offer um, can be very valuable, but there's some there's some tax considerations that go along with those, the timing okay. of them, um, as well as I think when we'll get into later some of the risk that gets built up when people aren't uh, handling them correctly. Mm. And beyond the RSUs, you usually have stock options, and and so a stock option. This is my definition of it. It's 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 basically. It rewards you to help grow the company, and sure. if the stock price grows beyond a certain point that you're offered a purchase at, you get to pocket the difference. It, in in some ways, it does some of the have some of the same effect as RSUs, but really, it's it's all about it's just a different mechanism. How do you get rewarded to help improve the company? 
Um, and then the last one is the ESPP plan. And interestingly, I don't, I don't find a lot of people using this. I think it's one of the most underutilized benefits in that way. Um, I want to say if I'm remembering the stat right, something like only 25 or 26% of people are oh. actually participating, um, which is a, it's a shame because really it, it's, it, it's a plan that gives you the option to buy your company stock at a discount oh. at regular intervals. Then if you use it correctly, it's, it's I mean, it's, very low risk. It's virtually risk-free really, if, if you use yeah. it correctly. Um, so it's, there's, those are three different components of that equity comp plan that, uh, are, these are, these are pieces only, um, usually available in publicly traded companies, um, in the way I'm describing them. They, some of these can be, um, available in the private companies, some with similar names, stock options, um, RSUs might be called restricted stock instead. Um, uncommon to have an ESPP. So, so private companies, non-public or traded, do have equity compensation to consider. Yeah. Whole different risk profile. Um, hard to value them. Hard to understand what you're getting in a job offer. Um, but and can you, be and, and super you, and a good financial advisor like yourself could could help somebody understand that, right? That's right. That's right. Yeah, view them in the right way. Um, and it's, you know, it's the reason that I obtained what's called the ECA. Um, we have a, there's a designation called equity compensation associate that oh, specifically okay. has to do with understanding how to utilize this and help, help people plan for it. Makes sense. Makes sense. It, it, I, and I know from past experience, just personally, it can be complicated and it, and it is, uh, you know, and, and the tax implications aren't always apparent. That's right. Yes. You know, you, I think a lot of people, they get, they get, they get the offer put in front of them and they think, Whoa, <laughs> that's right. Yes. <laughs> and they don't go much beyond that. And you, it sounds like correctly take them to a, a better understanding of exactly what they're looking at. Right. And, and, and a, a, I'll emphasize, especially on the private company side, because it's very difficult to understand what things are really worth in, in that situation. Yeah. You're talking about people who are going to work, for example, for startup companies that have not yet done any public offering, right? That's right. That's exactly yeah. right. So that's equity compensation. So we're still, we're still kind of on this. What's, what are the common benefits that, that seem to be different? Yeah. The, the other one is it's something called NUA. And it's, it stands for net unrealized appreciation. And, uh, this is, this is only going to be available in a publicly traded company. Um, it's, it's got a, um, it's eligible under a special tax code. And, um, really the only thing we need to understand right now for this episode is that it's, it's a way for you to, if you have company stock inside your retirement plan, yeah, commonly your 401k, it's a way for you to make a distribution of that stock and pay capital gains rates versus income tax rates. So let me back up a second there. Um, just to make sure, you know, I'm, I'm sure a lot of listeners are going to have some idea of this, but just make sure we catch everybody up. Everything that goes into your retirement plan, um, typically, typically is pre-tax. You haven't paid tax on it. You defer right. some of your paycheck, goes into your 401k, no tax. When you take it out, it's going to be taxable at your income rate. Income rates, especially in this industry where we have higher compensation, mm -hmm. can often get up into the mid to high tax brackets. Yeah. Capital gains rates are often much lower. Capital gains rates could be zero, 15, maybe 20%. And so if we can have... Uh, a benefit that we can utilize correctly, we can actually take some of that company stock out and pay a much lower tax rate on it. Oh, oh, that's good. Yes, yeah, it, it can really it it's it has to be handled with care. There's a lot of gotchas in this particular uh, benefit, and you got to be careful. But we're, that's why we're, we're probably going to actually have to do a whole episode on this because of the the nuances to just not only how it works tax wise, but then even how each individual company's plan works. So we'll come back to that. Yeah. 
I'm sure. The third one, this is the fun, the fun name I mentioned at the top, the mega backdoor Roth. Yeah. <laughs> sounds a little bit clandestine. It sounds like of. a fast food special. Though. <laughs> it does. Yeah, it does. It's legit. You know, it's, it's a total, it's, it's just a, a fun name. The industry has given it, but really what it involves is uh, some companies. And, and, th and this is why it's, it's unique. Is it some companies plans, 401k plans yeah. offer a feature called an after tax contribution. Um, so there's multiple different ways you can put money into your 401k. I just mentioned earlier with, like with NUA that typically money goes in pre-tax. Yeah. Um, the other common feature is to put money into a Roth IRA, the third contribution type, which is not that common is to be able to put in money after tax. Yeah. And the reason it's not that common is that you, you generally have to have a large enough company, the broad enough, uh, employee base and the employee base has to have a high enough income uh, on average. And if you think about what we just said earlier, this tends to have a little higher compensation in the industry. Companies like Boston Psy or Medtronic or some of these other larger ones, they actually can pass testing by um, in what it takes to allow this feature. Not usually available in the small companies. Now, what it does is it allows you to basically defer um, much, much higher than the normal the normal rates people talk about. Right. Mm -hmm. And once the money goes in there, it can be converted to a Roth IRA and be, the whole thing is tax-free. Wow. That's fantastic. It, it, it really is. And if you do it correct, we, we find that, I mean, just I mean it could be painful. It could be painful for somebody listening to this who didn't realize that that is the net in, you know, the net impact of, of, of uh, a mega backdoor Roth. That's right. But, uh, Wow, that's interesting. So it's something we want to coordinate with all the other benefits. And I'll talk about that in, in just a little bit here. Um, but after the the backdoor Roth, and, and again, it depends if the plan has it. What, what, what I'm finding is that um, there's quite a few companies that offered it at one point and then phased it out. So there's some nuances. You really have to dig into um, some of the plan documents. I found just as an interesting kind of side note as I was researching recently, there's a there's a company I'll leave unnamed right now, but I saw at least four different uh, ways that they could use the retirement plan depending on what company they came from when this large company acquired them. And there's they they end up with some protected benefits. Mm. And if you think about it, in in this industry, you've got the huge companies, more or less swallowing up all the startups. Yeah. Uh, or you know some of them are medium sized, but so now these these employees, they might go through two or three different uh, ownerships of the of the company and two or three different you know benefit packages, and so some of those have to be protected. So the point is is that the complexity comes in knowing which of these companies have these sort of hidden nuggets. Mm. Nice. <laughs> Very nice. Um, it, there's a lot to unpack here, obviously. And so, you know, clearly we've got a lot of material for <laughs> many episodes to come, but one of the things I really want to get into on this is that you and I were talking before we started the podcast, you're talking about different kinds of challenges and opportunities in the med tech sector. What do you mean by that? And explain it. Sure. So as we, as we start to utilize some of these benefits, which, which are great, um, they, they can actually create their own challenges. So the, the, uh, the first one, um, the first one we're going to, we're going to talk about is something we refer to as a concentrated position. So, mm -hmm building up a concentrated position in the company stock. Mm. Now, if you think back to what we just talked about, if if someone was utilizing their equity compensation plans, yeah. utilizing the ESPP and building up a bunch of stock on their own, getting RSUs and holding on to those, 
then acquiring stock in their 401k plan. Um, and then because uh, in the industry, they uh, we see a lot of people that are fairly loyal and familiar with their company. They might even yeah. buy stock in their own brokerage account. So we'll, we'll start working with someone and realize, do you realize how much of your net worth is really tied up in the company that pays your food bill? Mm. You know? A balance, a balanced portfolio comes into this. <laughs> yes. Right? Yep. Exactly. It, it's, you know, there, there's not really an exact science on this level. It's what, what constitutes concentrated stock. Um, you know, some experts will say 10%, like that's the rule of thumb. Um, some will say as high as 15, if everything else is diversified, um, some as low as five, but I, I think the way we approach it is it, it's not so much an absolute level of how much company stock or the percentage of your net worth you have. Yeah. It has a lot more to do with, um, what's the risk capacity, how much, how much risk can you take with your overall planning? Are you, are you able to continue holding that stock, even if it goes the wrong direction? Um, what are some acceptable tax ramifications? So if you just unload it just to get unconcentrated, are you going to lose a, you know, way too much in taxes? Um, and then, you know, it could really, really even depend on your position in the company. So if you're, if you're at an executive level, you might actually have a certain requirement, a certain amount of stock you're sort of socially expected to, or even, even explicitly expected to hold. Yeah. Um, so the concentrated issue, just whenever someone kind of espouses that there's a specific level, you get above that, it's it's wrong. Just it needs to be custom to your to your situation. Sure. No, that's understandable. Um, beyond that, beyond the concentrated position, which is definitely the biggest one, uh, where you can really add a lot of value if you take time to do the planning right, has to do with optimizing your lifetime tax rate. And yeah, it, I've heard other financial advisors talk about it. it's not what you pay in taxes now, it's what you pay in taxes over time, over right. your lifetime or your time at, at, at a company or whatever. Yes. That's right. Yes. Well said. It, It's, you know, the... No tax preparer wants to deliver the bad news for that one year that someone owes money. Um, but that's kind of irrelevant, you know, if it's built into the plan and you know it's coming. And so uh, putting enough work into into timelining out all the different income sources you have. Um, we What we didn't mention in some of these that could be unique because some of these companies are so large and, and have been around long enough. We might have employees that have a pension plan built up, then the pension, so they have a decent amount of pension plan income yeah. coming. Then they've built up a number of equity compensation components. They have their NUA, which has a different ramification. Their after-tax 401k, their social security is going to come online at some point. And, you know, who knows, maybe they, maybe they know they have an inheritance coming or the sale of a business. And all those have to be timelined out and figured out when do we spend from which bucket? Mm. when we've done this for people um which we're doing it all the time of course but it, it's fun to it's kind of fun to come back with some of the illustrations and the the, the tax software we're able to use in the planning software and take a look at do you realize if we make these moves plan out your income this way um you know the tax savings can easily dwarf um you know, a significant amount of the the investment return because it's really just not not what you make; it's what you keep. Yep. Yep. So that's the, that's the big one: concentrated stock risk that comes from these unique benefits. Then the optimizing of the lifetime income plan. Um, I guess the last thing I'd say on that on the lifetime income plan is, um, for retirees specifically they'll often come into their later earning years with probably the highest income they've been making. Of course. Yeah. They they may have built up then some savings outside their retirement accounts. They may go into retirement and live off of some savings with a fairly low tax rate. 
um, not kind of thinking about the tax bomb that's coming uh, <laughs> when their social security turns on and their required minimum distributions at age 73. And so it looks a little bit like a smile in the way they spend. Um, and so we just need to smooth that out. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, before we wrap this episode up, I you talked at one point about opportunities. This industry, obviously, I think, presents some unique opportunities and probably people who are, are going to take advantage of them would be wise to take advantage of them with their eyes wide open, as it were. Yes, I, I think it, it, it mostly, when I'm referring to that, I'm referring to um, taking advantage of the, the opportunity to join a startup or to start your own company. Mm. Not everybody's going to do that. There's a huge uh, risk and reward component to it. Um, but if if you need to follow your follow your heart on that, follow the the mission of of what what you set out to do, it's it's absolutely worth it. Just know that you need to be prepared. <laughs> this is good stuff, uh, Matt. This is really good stuff. Um, obviously, we could go on at at, at length on this topic alone. Um, and I know that you are going to be covering it in some of the podcasts yet to come, but people listening to this right now find it interesting and want to get a hold of you. How would they reach out to you and, 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 and initiate a conversation or find out more? Yeah. I think the easiest way is this to, to learn more at our website. It's perspective six group.com. It's the number six group.com. Uh, if, if you get there, there's actually a white paper that I wrote that helps you look at ways to maximize your 401k plan. It's specifically written for Medtronic's plan, but uh, it, a lot of the principles apply as well to other plans. Okay. I'll be adding a few others for other plans in the future. Um, and you can check out our articles on our blog. There's there's information about the equity compensation topics as well there. Mm -hmm. um, or just give us a call. It's 952-225-0333. Fantastic. Uh, listeners, thank you for taking the time to listen. We hope you found this enjoyable and useful information. If you are not already a subscriber, this is easy. Hit the subscribe button. That way you'll be notified when Matt comes out with his next episode. You won't miss it, and you'll be there to listen to what he has to say. Uh, thank you once again for listening. On behalf of Matt, I'm Bill Tucker, and on everybody at Funny Focus Financial, Thanks for listening and reminding you, don't wait. Live your best life today. Thank you.